thank you everybody for being so patient. Uh, it's just great to have such an appreciative, patient audience. Thank you. Okay, um, we're actually now uh, kind of combining two parts of today's Art of Seaweed Festival events. And we're pulling together artists who have come to visit us, but also local artists who've taken part in the festival at other points. And we're going to try and get a wee bit of a discussion going on about using seaweed as a material or inspiration. So we're going to ask from questions from the floor and comments, but because yesterday I didn't quite get it right and I didn't get people to sit in front of the microphone, I'm going to get you to come out. So just be aware of that. If you say anything, I'm going to get you to do it because I keep forgetting to re kind of repeat it. So um, without further ado, I'm going to ask Christina Riley, artist who's come to visit us from the northwest, well, another part of the northwest coast, to come and talk to us about her work and seaweed. Come and join. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me up to, to speak about seaweeds, which... I'll try and squeeze into a few minutes, but I think everyone here agrees that there's a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I came up, I'm actually, I'm down in Ayrshire, um, just on the west coast near Arran, uh, across the water from Arran, uh, where we have lots of beautiful, beautiful seaweeds. But it was on Eastdale Island uh, that I, uh, um, it was on Eastdale Island that I first, sorry, what's it? Uh, first kind of, came across seaweeds. Uh, so I kind of started off, I'm a photographer um, generally. So I went to Easto not on any kind of work project or anything. I was just visiting with a friend uh, and we had a free afternoon and we ended up going seaweed foraging with a forager there called uh, Duncan Smallman. And he just took us out for half an hour uh, to look at seaweed. And he was showing us the seaweed. I was photographing things as we were going because it was all very new and very beautiful. Uh, but it was when he was picking seaweed off, off the rocks and letting us taste it. And um, he, we tried a few and it was delicious and really interesting and I'd never done that before. But he took pepper dulse uh, and I thought he was like winding us up. I was just like, this, he's like seasoned this in his pocket and he's like, oh, taste this delicious seaweed. Uh, but that's just, that was it. That's how it is straight off the rock. It was abundant. It was this material or this something that I had been walking along past, like on the shores for years and had never even noticed. Um, so that just kind of sparked something in me and I got home. So as a photographer, I got home. I was just in my living room. And I thought I'll look up uh, seaweed photography. Like how can I bring this into my practice somehow? Um, and Anna Atkins, um, she came up and after all my photography study I'd never heard her name before so that in itself was mm. just so much to learn um and I loved the way that she just this idea of using cameraless photography like really interested me um I love photographing nature and I love looking at the natural world but I never really connected with like wildlife photography um and that aspect of it in landscapes that's never been for whatever reason um it always seemed like there was a lot of like gear needed mm -hmm. rather than, and I was like, I, did, I almost wanted like less cameras and less gear. Uh, so to, I started off doing cyanotypes, which then led me to uh, lumen prints as well, which I, I use with uh, seaweeds and seagrass. And I got to, I had the honor of spending time with me at Not Valid and Studies on Mull, where I made some lumen prints there and we went looking for plenty of seaweeds. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, just see, we kind of made me realize that I could, you can capture the natural worlds like in fragments and in these very small details. Um, and seaweed was the first one of those for me. And I think an ongoing theme that I've heard quite a few people say is this, when you look at something closely, you actually see so much more, um, which also is tied into another thing that came up, which is when you start to learn something, you realize just how much you don't know. Um, and that's just one of the most exciting things for me about not just seaweeds, but then anything in the shore area and mm -hmm. in kind of intertidal zones. 
just, I mean, it's, it's still, it's ongoing, even just like the past day, I've, there's more things I think, oh, I need to go and look for that mm -hmm. next time I go out. Um, so yeah, it's kind of once I started looking at these tiny details and you think they're not really so tiny and coming at it from an artist standpoint, you start to learn about the scientific um, importance of it and the importance of it with the climate and with our, with our habitats. And I think maybe because I'm not a scientist and I don't really know a lot to do, or I'm trying to learn, but it's having another route into that information, mm -hmm. whether it is just by seeing how beautiful something is. Um, I overheard a young girl saying in the tent over there, you, when you learn about something and you see how beautiful it is and then that's how you can learn to care about it. That's how you find something mm. to care about and it gives you some sort of roots into it where otherwise it can be very overwhelming. So I think that's where mm -hmm. I really like focusing in on those details and seaweeds for me was that first, I, you'd call it a detail, but also it's just like it's so, mu yeah, it's, it's so much part. more than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's, kind of that's how seaweed came into my practice and then it's it does incorporate I guess um anything that you can find on the beach so shells and what used to live in them um pebbles now that kind of the coralline algae of like learning slowly more about that since since mm -hmm. being here I'm really interested in that um and yeah it's just that kind of act of like looking and collecting for mm -hmm. me I think um mm -hmm collecting seaweeds, collecting these little pieces of information in mm. different ways. Um, yeah. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I think that just kind of connects to everything we've been trying to do mm -hmm. here. Those little pieces of seaweed, bringing them off the beach, bringing them, taking them to Fiona's gut lab and just looking at them under the USB magnifiers is just just mind-blowing just that. that simple technology <laughs> and not even with any technology just to take you know just to go and look but also to grab hold of a magnifier and go right in there yeah. yeah and just to hold it and observe it and I think for our first festival that it is so what we're about mm. so please do there's going to be lots of opportunities this afternoon with lots of artists out there working and doing different things which you're all invited to join in on so I hope you will Thank you. We'll probably kind of get to questions in a little bit, but yeah, that's great. Nigel, would you like to join us? Nigel Goldie is an artist that lives and works um, in the Loch Inver area, and he was is part of the We Show we've got in um, Ullapool in the Windows and Antala Solos, and um, he his particular work is combining the pieces of dried kelp that we've got just about everywhere. <laughs> and so he's just going to talk a little bit about that. Yep. So yep. perhaps I can begin by illustrating something that I think, Mika, you were pointing to, and it comes out of the, the wonderful uh, story about the, the sailors and finding the <laughs> serpent. This is one of the biggest problems I have with kelp. <laughs> just to illustrate, if you can see it, it looks just like a serpent, and it's wonderful in its own way. And I dare say people here have picked these up and wondered what, what do you do with it, and maybe take it back and have it at home as, a, as something that's kind of, kind of interesting or quirky or, or just... In, but it's... I mean, the problem in a way is it's kind of naturally sculptural. Now, I say it's a problem because it, 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 in one sense you may say, well, that's fine, that is, it, it's done it all for you, <laughs> we have this there. But if you're trying to take something that you have found, as it were, in nature and turn it into something that you want it to, to, to embody that maybe the qualities of it, but not be simply reproducing it, um, you, it becomes somewhat problematic because it, 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 it's so much to say you could just leave it. And then this, I think the same thing applies sometimes when you find a, a lovely piece of old a wood that's shaped in a certain way, and you put put it on your shelf, and it, and it seems like a natural piece of sculpture. Well, I, I think, and this isn't just a, don't just defend the interests of artists, but I think it doesn't become, you might say, sculpture unless you, uh, it's, it, you there's been an intervention into it that actually begins to transform it into being something different. So you see other qualities in it, or it represents, or it 
raises ideas and images and so on. So all I'm just saying is that the, one of the problems with, with kelp is that the, one of the other problems is, and I can give examples of this, the, 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 these are some random bits of kelp I happen to have lying around. And what you find is that some are incredibly strong and incredibly rigid. Now just hand around two, two pieces, you pass them around. I, I wonder how many people have ever cut a piece of kelp, especially uh, it's one that's an old, <laughs> it, you know, dried kelp. And you'll see it take the simplest way to cut it is to use the, this cutting disc on, on, on an angle grinder. Okay, you, you can do it with a hacksaw, but you've really got to work hard on it. I can see, like, you know what it's like, don't you? And yet, a cutting and, and that's that shows you how strong it is. It, it, it feels or like as strong as steel. And I'll just pass these, if you want to pass them, I took two little bits. I just, I should have, I could have brought more, but I didn't have time. So this morning I thought I should take something because it's easier to have something to, to, to look at. And that, that means you've got these remarkable qualities. On the one hand, it's got great strength, but it's also something that's very kind of flexible, as you can see with these. But above all, it, once you've made something, um, you think you're using it when it's, it's strong, it's solid, <laughs> and it might be, a, it, and then, you know, the weather changes, as it does up here, <laughs> and, and, and it's become humid or wet, it's draining, and what happens is, it's suddenly gone floppy. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it, it literally, it, it, it changes. Now, and you can have kelp, when I've got kelp, which is now six, seven, eight years old, and it has still the qualities of something like wood, but, if you're in the right or the wrong kind of climactic conditions, it will begin to change again. So it, 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 I'm just mentioning this. It's a kind of interesting sort of what, what is it to work with it? I'm trying to say that it's got this kind of natural attractiveness, and yet it, it becomes problematic, I think, because, and in fact, one of the things I found most liberating a while ago, I was trying to think how to do something different, in part for this show and, and what's in the, and the window of Anton Solis, and I was struggling making, uh, I like com to combine things, and the way I've been combining uh, elements of kelp is really to drill through it and then to li literally joint it by using, working one bit of kelp into another, so you, it, it creates a different form. But I, I was struggling with the, the fact you had these, these either the, the decorative floral bits like these on the end, or, or the, these parts of the root, um, or the heads, and I, I just thought, well, I just thought, I'm going to, I decided to just to cut off the head, one of these heads, and it was the most liberating thing to do, because <laughs> suddenly it, it ceased to be what it had been and became something that was more like a, 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 some other kind of material you might have found, which could be used in a way that didn't, it want, the head wasn't so dominant. So I'm just, so just to pick up, something that's a bit close to what I've got in the window of Aunt Hallow, which I'd, I'd made then, and, and, and Julie came up with this idea, which I think is a very good one, of hanging them one after another because it had limited space there. But it's just a very simple example of the kind of thing I like to be doing. And it's to take d these different, picking up different elements, d different pieces, or to cut pieces, and begin to see what can be done that makes something that is very simple, really. It's kind of interesting to look at, but also, more importantly than that, it's when you kind of move it around, and even better, if you've got two pieces or three pieces, and you can move them around, and you can create almost an infinite number of different types of visual... Uh, so something I think is kind of visually interesting. It's not... It's hard work from where you are, but I can leave it around for anyone to play around with something like this. But it, it, it's... It, I think kelp, because it almost the strength of its qualities that come out of the materials also lends itself to be, being something that you can use in a kind of um, sculptural way. It's a particular type of sculpture. It's, it, it's about how you make, what the lines are, what the relationships are, what's happening within it in, in, a, in a very kind of minimalist, abstract way. So maybe I should stop there. That's, That's <laughs> absolutely wonderful uh, to actually see it. And if you get a chance... Yeah. If you actually get chance to get into Ullapool to have a look in the windows of the gallery, uh, there's a whole sequence of them suspended, um, and it's it's very very beautiful. And I actually love this one in particular because 
I have not seen it where you've combined the different colours of the, the different kelp. Yeah, yeah. And I love that. And the simplicity of it, where it's just cut and joined and combined. And that anyone who's done 3D work and sculpture knows that it's the combination, it's the joints that really matter. And I think this is just great. I just love it. And yeah, it's a really hard material. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Right. Um, yeah, leave it there for a minute. Christina? Oh, Christina, sorry, Christina. Um, Christine Riley, I'm oh, just, oh, just <laughs> like, okay, I'm really losing it now. Okay, Justine Riley, um, Richie. Okay, <laughs> cut. <laughs> Christine Riley is one of our five artists in the gallery windows in Ullapool. And when I first, it was a really tight deadline when I asked people to kind of come forward to kind of be part of the show. And the fantastic thing about Justine is that she said that she was just beginning to get into cyanotypes and was inspired by Anna Atkins' work, which we've seen a lot of. And it was just like, it was great, perfect timing, wasn't it? And I just felt, oh, how exciting that, um, that you're beginning this and we're beginning this festival and it would be really great for you to be part of it. So thank you for joining us. So I'm going to ask you to say a wee bit about how tricky it is to work with seaweed. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, yes, so I first started dabbling in cyanotypes. I'm also a photographer. Um, and I was living on the Isle of Egg at the time. So it was beginning of lockdown number one that I discovered the work of Anna Atkins. And living on an island that's only three miles by five miles, every walk you end up on the shore pretty much. Um, and so having photographed every corner of the island from every angle um, and viewpoint and in every weather, I then decided to start looking at um, experimenting with cyanotypes. So while I was on the Isle of Egg, again, I was just picking up various bits of flora um, and then um, starting to work with seaweed as well. Um, and seaweed is, is very diff different because it's obviously wet and then it dries out. Um, and I've then moved to um, Ullapool and started looking around the shores of Loch Broom and discovering all the different seaweeds there and experimenting a bit more with the cyanotype process which involves basically coating a piece of watercolour paper um, or similar paper with a light sensitive emulsion and then putting your bit of seaweed or whatever found flora on top of it and then exposing it to sunlight. So it's a very simple form of cameraless photography. And although it's simple, it's incredibly transformative. Um, you, you just see the transformation within minutes and it depends on the intensity of sunlight it's not like a camera you can put your setting various settings it's totally different you rely on the intensity of the sunlight so you're gauging how long to leave it exposed to the sun um, and you can also um, do create wet cyanotypes which is what I like to do to create a, a bit more of um, a sense of movement and motion an atmosphere to the print. And this can be um, by spraying the paper with, um, I use often seawater, um, or you can even put sea foam on top of it mm -hmm. and create um, an imprint. So I've got an example here. This is, this is actually a reject of one that I've done with um, some seaweed, which I'm not even sure what type of seaweed it is, but um, as you can see there. And that was a wet cyanotype. And with the seaweed, it can also um, bleed into the, 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 the paper and the chemicals. Mm. So it's got a little bit of brown oh, tinging yeah. Yeah. going on there, which I presume is from the iodine. For, or, um, 
and also the salt. So again, you don't know what you're going to, the print is going to turn out like until you then fix it. So you bring it in from the sunlight and then you just use water to fix it. So you rinse it for about five minutes um, in the water and um, out and then leave it to dry. And again, that 48 hours of drying, again, the colors um, and the textures change. Um, so I'm now totally obsessed with seaweed. My garden fence is strung <laughs> with different varieties. Every time I go for a wild swim in the lock, I come out with another different bit or I'm my my entry to the water is staggered because I'm discovering bits of seaweed along the way. Um, and um, so, yes, uh, uh, my next, um, I think this is going to be an ongoing project with seaweed. Um, and I think the next thing is to move into anthotypes, which again is using a light sensitive emulsion, but made totally from, so it's not chemicals, it's made totally from crushed plant material. Um, but then you can't, there's no way of fixing it. So it's a very ephemeral print. So when you have it, it will completely, um, it will continue to transform and fade. Um, but I think that's something quite nice about it. It's that whole cycle. Um, so yeah, watch the space for. Fantastic. I think what is, what you've touched on, which um, I think um, Meek certainly did. And one of the things I hope we can all get into this afternoon is the sensory element of it and again that touch and experiencing it when you're picking it and and just exploring it with your hands but also um comes to mind the poem that you read about swimming swimming in the sea lettuce just yeah. fantastic and I'm sure we can kind of spend the afternoon all kind of sharing those experiences and this is a good point to say that if you've got those experiences, just write them down on a piece of paper and put them in the in the big jar in the in the big kelp tent. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. And that was Justine Ritchie. Okay. So Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um Fion, would you like to say a few words? This is a very last minute request I had. I've been making last minute requests around in the room for people to come and join me. And Fionn Duffy is an artist who's been working with our archaeologist, Cathy Dagg, and helping with the big kelp um, burning experiment that has been got ongoing for the whole of this year and even the previous year. And you'll hear a bit more about that from Cathy at two o'clock. But now this is Fionn Duffy, and she's going to tell you all about her experience of working with seaweed. Hi there. Um, yeah, I don't have anything to show you, but my part or my interest in the seaweed experiment is uh, making glass out of it. So I don't know if you know, glass is made from, or soda lime glass, which is like the softest kind of glass that is, most things are made from. Uh, is made from soda ash, which comes from burning the seaweed, uh, silica, which is uh, sand, and lime, which you can make from crushed seashells. Um, if you burn it, you make a quick lime, which then you can use to make glass. And <laughs> I don't really know how much to talk about it because Kathy's talk, I'm sure, is going to go into a lot of depth about the kelping industry. But that was kind of my entry point into working with seaweed. Um, I was interested in making glass from scratch because it's such a ubiquitous material. It's around us all the time. We use it every day. But it's a very industrial process um, using lots of chemicals and it feels very far away from the day-to-day -day experience mm. that we have. And I learned about the kelping industry, which is where uh, people were burning mostly rack um, at this point to make this, this soda ash to then be sent to industrial centres like Liverpool um, or like around Edinburgh to make glass. And that was happening around the 18th century. Um, I'm like, what else should I say? I, know, I, was, just, I, was, I was just thinking the, the thing that for me, I think it would be lovely for you to share is what a mucky job it is. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's a very long <laughs> process from beginning to end, and you do get very wet and very dirty. Um, Kathy, again, will talk about the like the amount of seaweed that you need mm. to get ash from it because most of it burns away or turns into carbon. Um, so me and my mum, who's also here and has been helping me a lot, uh, have been out gathering just buckets and buckets, like, and I mean bin buckets, like this size uh, of wet seaweed, drying it out in out the back of the house. Uh, I, I should have... If I'd known, I would have brought photos. I know, I know. And so <laughs> there is a few. So on the Instagram account, there is um, a bit of a record of yourself and a few of us in May collecting it when I was mm. turning it over over at Old Dorney. And we'll put some more images up of Kathy's on the site because I think it would be really great to share that whole process. Um, do you want to say something about the weight of all the, that volume of seaweed? <laughs> Uh, so you have that volume of seaweed wet, and then you leave it out to dry. You get about half of that. And then once you've burned it, um, in each of our burns, we've got about this much ash. <laughs> so it is... It yeah, is incredible, isn't incredible it? So from a dumpy bag to that much, if you're lucky. Yeah. And to make the glass, I need about 15 kilos of the ash. So, so far I have maybe between, between 10 and 12, probably with what we got from the one on Friday. Wow. Um, but that's been us, we've done two burns in that, kil in that kiln and I've done two or three at the house as well. Um, and each time with around four, between four big buckets of dried stuff and eight big buckets of dry stuff. I don't know how much that is yeah. to that, weigh. That about. sounds about right to me. Yeah. So is this a request for kind of more collectors to get to your I 15K? Mean, <laughs> <laughs> if anyone wants to give me some dry seaweed, yeah. I'll be happy to take it. Um, but I will be making the glass in November, so it's got to be in the next couple of months. That's great. Um, so what form do you think... It will be in the glass. Um, oh. Well, that's that'll depend on how the glass uh, behaves. Okay. So, because, uh, like, you see people working with glass, like blowing glass and stuff, it's got a lot of extra chemicals to make sure that it's um, it's not going to crack so easily, or you can heat it up or cool it down quickly or faster than um, if you're making it from raw materials. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's a huge experiment. Um, I want to make a series of glass beads mm -hmm. because I've had a lot of help with different parts of the project, um, not just the kelping part, but um, like talking to people about the geology and the way that sand forms, like stone, things like that. Um, so I'd love to make beads to then be able to like uh, give them to everyone that's helped me. So it's a kind of distributed piece of artwork. Uh, but I don't know if that'll be possible because uh, when you every time you heat up glass, you weaken it. Or every time you cool down glass, you weaken it. It's easy to heat up, but harder to cool down. And to make beads, you need to do lamp work, which is where you have a flame and then heat up a rod of glass on the flame. So I would need to make a rod first and then oh, so there's two heat cool it down once and then heat it up again. Yeah. So I don't know how much that's got to do no, with seaweed. No, no, it has. But, uh, because it's the ingredient, isn't it? It's one yeah, of the ingredients. But yeah. that's brilliant. And so um, when you've experimented and whatever you come up with, could you share it with us so that we could share it to everyone who's here? Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's all right. Um, and we look forward to listening to Cathy telling us a bit more about the mucky process. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, our final artist who's going to be talking this, this just now, let me get the name right, David Faithful, um, is kindly kind of joining us and he's going to be running um, a kind of 
workshop outside. Yeah, look at this. I'm going to have to try and... It's the gloopy mixtures that he's been making, and he'll tell you all about it, but this is taking seaweed even to a, a new level. <laughs> no, let's take all the beautiful artwork. Uh, okay, thanks, Julia. Um, yeah, my relationship with seaweed is a bit more prosaic. I'm not particularly interested in the visual aspects of it. I used to do a lot of scuba diving, and I really enjoyed throwing lumps of kelp around the beach. Um, so I don't really, not interested in it aesthetically. And, and um, Meek was talking about uh, Matisse's drawings comprising of seaweed. I always thought that was Swiss um, cheese plants, so I'm going to have to review my relationship with Matisse, who I, is one of my favorite artists. Anyway, I'm using seaweed as a printmaker. I'm fed up using plastic acrylics uh, and the fear of all these kind of uh, acrylics going down the drain. So I'm using seaweed. Um, seaweed I'm using is this stuff, Manitex, which is Scottish powdered kelp. Um, I started this on the beach in Spain, uh, St. Andrew, a printmaking festival, where cuttlefish ink is very... Um, easily available. So I was using this black uh, squid ink mixed with the jelly from the seaweed. You get this nice, uh, like, crude oil. Um, printing on the beach, very experimental. I'd never done this before to see what happened. Um, basically, the tide came in and washed it away. So it was like this black, um, almost like a kind of hydrocarbon deposit of crude oil. But it's all completely biodegradable, squid ink and uh, seaweed. So what I've been doing since then is um, a project mixing it with berries. We've got some nice berries from the Isle Martin uh, forests here. Uh, we've got rowan, hawthorn, elderberry, and bramble with a bit of raspberries there. And some um, and seaweed knowledge is not great as that, bladderwrack, something like that. So I've squeezed bladderwrack last night in a tin bath with uh, John and Colleen, and uh, we got some disgusting gunge, which I've mixed in with this. So it's very experimental. I'm using it. Possibly as an alternative, one at uh, some point into the studio where you actually use it instead of acrylic mediums, which does interest me a lot. But what we're going to do today um, is I've got some drawings that Julia got uh, from local school kids. That's seaweed heart. That's some uh, laminaria, I think. Uh, not sure what that one is. Spaghetti, and we've got a nice fish there, okay? <laughs> so what I've done is, basically... So I've cut these, the stencils, that's the heart, seaweed. And we're going to try printing these on the beach. So what I'd I encourage you, who's interested, is to come down to the stone jetty, and we're going to try and print them through the stencils and the wee squeegees over there onto the pier. The idea is this is all biodegradable. We've even got some of Steve's um, paprika <laughs> mix, which is such a fantastic color. We've been eating it all weekend that I thought we have to try printing that. Again, it's pretty natural. Um, that's Rowan, um, that's the bramble. And I've also got some moon rock here, which is an orthocyte and basil, which is from Iona, which I've pulverized up, which is a different project. I'll not go too much into that, but that's a very gloopy <laughs> moon rock. So normally on the beach, the tide would come in and wash it all away. Um, the weather's not great, so it might just be this horrible jelly gunge that sits there for three days. But hopefully the sun will dry it. And when it dries, which I did with uh, John, who's around there in Norway last year, and it, it dried really hard on the rock, almost like a, a rune or something on the, on, the, on the beach runes, which is beautiful. I don't know if the weather will allow that today. Um, but otherwise, the seagulls will get it or the sea slugs. <laughs> Um, or the fish, etc. So it's got biodegradable printmaking. And I think that ephemeral quality that some of the other people were saying in, um, in cyanotypes or, or makes ink uh, pigments from the seaweed are quite, quite interesting too. I'm, I'm interested in ink as well. So that, uh, for those who don't know, um, um, the, what's the ink called again? Uh, correctly, brain's gone. Um, the sepia ink is, is derived from cuttlefish, um, and it was superseded by industrial inks. So I'm interested in ink, and it started about as an ink project here, looking at old inks. Okay, but that black is pretty that spectacular, is amazing, I think. So, yeah. um, okay. So that's the plan. Whoever is interested now, 
Uh, we're going to head off to the, the jetty. I think there's other art projects on it as well. But who ever, ever wants to try some screen printing on a pier with seaweed? And uh, don't eat this. I, don't, I can't guarantee that this is uh, high edible quality seaweed. It is Scottish seaweed, but it's for printmaking. And actually, just to mention that all these T-shirts you see use this. The dye is um, mixed with uh, the seaweed on uh, industrial printmaking. It goes into the T-shirt, and then you wash the T-shirt and the dye away, the, the medium away, so you're left with the dye. And also, these very uh, complex salt... Um, kind of geometric hiking socks and uh, running socks are used seaweed as a kind of uh, sculptural aspect and then it's washed away and you're left with the, the thread of the socks. So it's got these kind of strange industrial uses. But uh, I want to find more out about this, but it is Scottish. Okay, thanks, that, Julia. That's wonderful. I'm just going to say um, that's absolutely brilliant, David, and it is great to see the gloopy, the gloopy mixes as well. And I'm Getting on gonna, your fingers. Yeah, yes, I'm going to come down and get it. All over, yeah, it's going to be great. Um, what I want to say is that David, wonderfully, is here all afternoon. So um, weather permitting, we're going to be in and out. So you can just dot in and out to the to the workshop. You don't have to stay for an hour or anything. It's not... I don't think it's going to take too long because no, okay, it won't. Uh, yeah, it'll yeah, yeah. <laughs> see how it goes. Yeah, because yeah. so just yeah, the screens so they, will be probably yeah. about half an hour or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. So okay. lots of different ways of using seaweed. Um, just to finish up today, I'm sorry, anybody online, we're not going to have time for questions. But if you want to write them into us, we'll kind of try and answer. Uh, answer. Um, just from my own perspective, the thing that I'm interested in is the kind of structure of different seaweeds and that whole kind of um, ability for something to resurrect its form according to the amount of water within it. Years ago, I worked with a fern called poly, um, Polypodium in America, and in, it used to dry out and it looked dead for kind of just six months of the year. Then the rains would come and it would come out and it would be grow and grow again and it'd be green and the whole process would start. What is amazing to me now is to come back to the seaweed and find that out and Certainly the channel rack is one of those that just really inspires me, the fact that it can look as dead as anything because it's in the splash zone and it's out of the water for so, so long. And yet the next tide comes in or the splash comes onto it and the whole form is resurrected and begins to grow again. That, to me, is just mind-blowing. So that's where I'm going with my seaweed. But thank you all for coming and joining in. And... I want everybody to kind of just send us information through the website, through Instagram, ask those questions. And thank you again also to Juliet Brody, who shared with us those amazing iridescent photographs that she's beginning to experiment with. So if you're listening, Juliet, thank you for that as well. Um, but thank you, everyone here. And we're going to talk to Kathy in a minute, but I know that we, a lot of people have been fantastic and have actually bought raffle tickets so we're going to do the draw